Okay, good evening everyone. I would like to welcome you all to my seminar about landscape photography. Um, I put a link in the chat room so so you can just click on the link, click on the Dropbox links and download the handout of the seminar, okay? And before I start my presentation, just I just want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Kawai Ling and I'm originally, originally from Malaysia. I was born in Malaysia, I grew up in Malaysia. And then after my high school, I went to Ukraine. I went to medical school in Ukraine. And then, so I stayed in Ukraine for six years. After that, I went to Stockholm in Sweden. I went to graduate school there. So I stayed there for another five years. About eight years ago, I moved to New Jersey. I worked as a research scientist at Princeton University. So about four years ago, I quit my job and then I began to become a landscape photographer. Okay, so in the past four years of my career, I focus mostly on the photo tour business and teachings and seminar and so on. I also work with different company like PhotoPro, Nissi, Fayutech and so on as their ambassador and as their marketing advisor and, and education advisor and so on. Okay, so running a photo tour and seminar allow me to be able to travel. I love travel. So I think combining my job with travel and photography is the best part of being a landscape photographer. This is just to, sh to, um, to show off what I got in the past few years. And today I would like to share with you some of my images and a few pieces of advice on how to get a better image in landscape photography. As you all know, we all locked down at home in the past six months, I think more than six months. And I have been living in New Jersey for eight years, but I never take out my camera and shoot in New Jersey. So in the past few months of my lockdown, I found some really nice thing in my backyard. Okay, <laughs> so, so here's some of the image I shoot in the past two months. So I, so this image I try to align the moon to the Empire State Building, shoot it from from the other side of the Hudson River, and here is some here are some shot the close up shot of the New York City, and here's the the lineup of the moon with the Statue of Liberty, and this is another one from, um, from the site, the site view of the Statue of Liberty, so. Yeah, sometimes there are some beauty in our backyard. So we have to just spend some time to explore it. Um, okay, so before that, let me share with you a short slideshow of my images taken in Antarctica in, uh, in the January this year.
Okay, so let's get into the landscape photography. The first question I would like to ask you all is that what is landscape photography? How do you justify that this is a good or bad image? So in the next five image, just ask yourself what make a good image, okay? So this image was taken in the Dolomites in Italy. And the first image here was taken in the early morning around nine to 10 a.m. Second image here, just taken from the same spot. This is around uh, afternoon um, in the overcast day. This is in the morning. The same spot, maybe a, a few steps, like 10 steps to, to, the, to the right from the previous image. And then this one is sunrise, after the sunrise. And this one is during sunset. So let's go back to the first image. So after seeing all these five images, what is the elements that make a good image? What do you think? And obviously in this case is the light. Of course, we have other elements like the composition, post-processing and so on, but the lights play a major role in this example. Early in the morning, in the afternoon, the hash light give the overall image the high contrast and it looks okay, but just looks like, it, but nothing more than, than a postcard shot. If you know this area well, this is the mountain area that can get foggy in the morning due to the high elevation and the temperature difference. And we are shooting toward the direction of the sunrise. So the sunrise around this spot here. So the sky can be colorful around the sunrise and it can be foggy in the morning. When the sun keep going up, it will reach the point when the sun just stop right at the peaks of the mountain. So with the smaller app stop, you are able to get a nice sunburst on top of the mountain. Okay, so what's happened during the sunset? Just during the sunset, the sun go to the other side, the front lighting cast the golden light on peaks of the mountain. And at the same time, it makes the uneven ground here looks three dimensional due to the low angle sunlight. So as you can see from this example, landscape photography is more than just going to a beautiful place for a so-called postcard shot. If you want to make your image look different from other, you have to master at least five of these. The first, the basic technique, the most basic thing after you get your camera, how to use your camera, how to set the camera, how to use a tripod, filter, and so on. The second and the third, understanding light and knowing the environment. So as you can see from this example, to be in the right place in the right timing is the key to success in landscape photography and the composition. And finally, the post-processing. We'll talk more about this in the later on uh, of my presentation. So the essence of landscape photography is that it's an art of seeing the unseen. We always try to shoot something that are not easily seen in our daily life or by the naked eye. And today I'm gonna to share with you four pieces of advice how to see the unseen. The first one, capturing the moment, lights and weather. Understanding the lights and weather is one of the most important elements in landscape photography because it allows us to capture the moment. When I talk about the moment, the moment in travel photography, in portrait photography, in documentary photography can be captured through the unexpected event, the facial expression of people, or the interaction between two people. Okay? However, in landscape photography, it works very differently. Understanding how the weather and light works and how we can use them efficiently are the key that allow us to capture the moment in landscape photography. So the key is that if you know where to go, when to shoot and what to expect in different lights and weather conditions, you can get the most from your, from your trip. This is the very challenging part of landscape photography. And here is a drone image of Reina in Lofoten in Norway. So for those of you who have been here, this is very popular photography location in the past few years. If you have been here, you probably recognize some of the most iconic mountain and villages here. Okay, so number here indicate five of the most common shooting spot in Lofoten. Believe it or not, if you know where to go and when to shoot, okay, you can get good lights in all these five locations in one single day. Okay, of course you need to know how to utilize the weather and as always a little bit of luck. I've done it before, I've done it many times in the past five years uh, during my photo tour to Lofoten. One day you can get a nice shot of all this location. 
So for example, in this particular day before the sunrise, there's a big snowstorm. So, so when the sun rises, you can see a lot of snow cover on top of the mountain. And, and also the calm windless there allow you to see the reflection in the water. And after this, the first shot of the day, we rush to the bridge, which is about two minutes driving from the previous location. And to capture when the, mo the moment where the sun illuminated the mountain, when the sun's going up a little bit more. Again, for those who have been here, you can rarely see the snow on the mountain and on, on the rock here because uh, they were easily swiped away by the wind uh, and the wave. So this is a precise condition after the heavy snowstorm. Always plan to be here after the snowstorm and in a calm, windless day. In a windless day, we can see the reflection everywhere. So after the previous shot, we just go to another spot uh, to get this shot done. Although we can see a reflection in the windless day, but in the, in the case of low temperature, when the temperature is very low, the reflection will be gone very quick because the still water, although this is the salt water, can get frozen in the low temperature. And during the sunset, we went to this iconic spot to capture the alpine grow on the mountain. Again, the reflection rarely happened in this part of the world. So when this happened, you know that this is the moment you would never want to miss. After the sunset, we ran to another fishing village for the brew hour to capture the cold and calm emotion rendered by the brew hour. So as you can see, to be in the right place in the right moment is the key to success in landscape photography. The best light just doesn't happen in any times of the day. So by uh, so when we talk about the natural light, by numerical definition, the golden hour happens when the sun is in between plus and minus six degree around the horizon. The blue hour happens when the sun is in between four to eight degree below the horizon. And the golden hour and blue hour are collectively known as magical hour. So as the name implies, the magic always happens during the golden hour and blue hour. So as I mentioned before, poetry photography, documentary photography can easily trigger the emotion from the expression of the face, the special moment or the interaction between two people. As for landscape photography, weather is probably the most important tool of triggering or evoking the emotion of the viewer. So let's take a look into this example. This is Gasadaru from Faroe Islands, a small village on Faroe Island. I think just 40 people living in this, this small village. But this small village has a very nice mountain in the background, a nice waterfall in front. So this is kind of the, the iconic landmark of Faroe Island. So this was taken during the golden hour right after the sunset. Okay, so here's a little bit story about this image. So this, this was taken in 2018, two years ago, or 2017, three years ago, when I first lead my photo tour to Faroe Island. It was a nice day in the morning. I brought my, I took my client to do some hiking, shoot some puffin in the daytime. They all have a good time in, in the daytime and they are all very tired. By the time they're back, we are back to the hotel. So they all wanted to go to bed but I saw the storm is coming. The storm is coming from the direction of the sun, sunset and the cloud were changing dramatically in the direction of the sunset. So I told my clients, something will be happening tonight. Who want to get out? Who want to go out with me? So half of them say, okay, let's go out and shoot. But half of them want to go to bed. That's fine, that's okay. So during the time of shooting, it was rainy, it was foggy, it was windy, we were all wet, we were cold, and we have to wipe the lens and shoot, wipe the filter and shoot. It was not a present to shoot. But when the sun is just touching the horizon, the sun is starting at this, around this point here, when the sun just touched the horizon, the magic happened. The, the rain and fog just spread out the golden tones of, uh, of the of this of this golden hour okay so and this just lasts for about two to three minutes that's it so this is what i mean the, i mean the moment it just happened in very short period of time and you can guess what's the reaction of those clients who were sleeping in the hotel when they saw this photo next morning okay this is called a moment 
once you miss it, you will never ever see it anymore in your life. I've been here more than 10 times, uh, but I don't think I will see this again in the same place in the rest of my life. This is the moment, okay? And the golden hour, the red golden tones in the golden hour render the sense of warmness, energetics, and dynamics. This is the emotion triggered by the golden hour or the golden tone. The same place, same times in the different days, different weather condition, the thick dramatic looking and ever changing cloud gives the image sense of cool, moody, and even a little bit of depressed. Okay, so this is an emotion triggered by the overcast day. While the misty day are perfect for capturing the atmospheric photo, it renders the sense of mysterious and dynamics. Clear sky, blue sky, cloudless day, calm day are good for traveling, good for sun bathing, but definitely not something that we want as a landscape photographer. Well, this is something we are hoping to have. Let's take a look. So the strength of the wind in this day is, is strong enough to, to roll my 40 pound camera back on the beach. So, so you can imagine how strong is the wind. Of course, this is a, an extreme example, but the storm are just excellent opportunity for dramatic and moody landscape. The dark cloud, the wild dramatic sea just make for spectacular images. And this is rather boring beach. As you can see here, there's no interesting foreground, but with a very nice background, with a very nice mountain as your backdrop. But of the storm, it's from very interesting uh, stripe on the beach. So which act, which is now become your, uh, your foreground elements and your leading line. So this has happened after the storm. So the key is that if you know where to go, when to shoot, and how to use the light. You can get the most from your trip. As Don McKeeling said, there's no such thing as bad light, just misunderstood light. And the second thing I want to share with you, how to see the unseen, is how to insert the elements of dynamism in your landscape photography. So for decades, people have been content that camera is a recording instrument. We use camera to record what we see with naked eye. Well, let's take a look into this interesting figure and find out how similar it is the camera to the human eye. Okay, when we talk about the lens, the camera, the widest lens designed for camera is 4.9 millimeter, while the longest lens ever produced for the camera is 5200 millimeter. If you want to go longer focal lens, you can use telescope. You can reach up to 8,000, 10,000 millimeter, and even more. But human eye is equal to a fixed wide angle lens of 17 millimeter and another study say is 24 millimeter so in other words we carry a fixed wide angle lens okay iso of your camera can go as low as 50 can go as high as 4 million and even more with the best camera we, uh, we can get today while the human eye can go from iso 1 to 800 only okay so in the other words we are quite incompetent in the low light conditions Aperture of the camera lens, this depends on the design of the lens. It can go as wide as 0 0.9, it can go as, as small as 28, 22, 36, 40 something, and, and so on. While we have the aperture as well, which is our pupil, our aperture goes from 2.1 to 8.3. The shutter speed of the camera can go from one away to a second, and you can, you can extend it as long as you want. Um, but the shutter speed of the human eye can go from 1 over 100 to 1 over 200 seconds. That's it. And I just want to remind you that the ISO, aperture, and shutter speed of our human eye are all in the auto mode. Okay, It's all controlled by our human brain. We can't adjust any of those settings. Okay. Um, the resolution of the camera, if you have $50,000, if you want to spend it to buy a camera, Phase one camera can give you the resolution of 150 megapixel, so which costs about $50,000, just the camera body, 
okay? But the resolution of the human eye can reach up to 576 megapixels, so which is three times as many as this $50,000 phase one camera. We always talk about the dynamic range of the human eye is much better than the camera. In fact, the dynamic range of the camera can reach up to 11 stop, while the dynamic range of the human eye can reach up to 14 stop. Theoretically, if we have the adjustable pupil, we can reach up to 24 stop. So in other words, if we have the adjustable pupil, human eye has infinite dynamic range. So if your eye is a camera, it costs that much, okay? So, and I just want to remind you that we have two pieces of this camera carry with us all the time. So what I'm trying to tell you is that camera is not just a recording instrument. It is a creative tool that allows you to see the unseen. For example, by using the high shutter speed, camera can see the moment when the bald eagle catch a fish. By using the slow shutter speed, camera can accumulate the light that is changing over the time in a single image. Okay. Mm, we can see by with the human eye, we can see the, the moment when the bald eagle catching fish. For her. And for human eye, we can see, um, for example, um, the long exposure. Uh, we can see like the image, like the long exposure when we do uh, one minute or two minute exposure of the Milky Way. We just can't see it with the human eye. Okay. So, and for a decade, photographer has been debating about static nature of landscape photography. And uh, today, I just want to tell you how to insert the element of dynamism into landscape photography by the use of long exposure photography, okay? So let's take a look at this example. This is one over 20 second exposure. And this is a nice image, nice landscape, um, nice light, nothing's wrong with it. But if you wanna make it a little special, you wanna make it uh, better, you can try long exposure with a 10 stop ND filter to lengthen exposure time by 1000 times. So with the use of 10 stop filter, it's now become 100 second. Now we can see that the moving cloud here create the motion blur of the cloud that bring out the movement. So in this case, something that's moving, there's a moving cloud. Something that's not moving, there's the mountain and the village. So it's create the motion and static contrast in this image, which make your overall composition much more appealing. When we talk about the contrast, probably you, you are more familiar with the, the color contrast. For example, when you're shooting the model, you always pose the model with the red dress and post it against the dark blue or dark green background because it's create the warm and cold color contrast. And an image with the contrast is much more, uh, has much more, visual impact is much more appealing to the human eye. So in this case, the motion and static contrast created by using long exposure photography. At the same time, use of long exposure smoothen the water, make the water much less distracting to the overall image. So I just want to say a few words about ND filter. Um, the, uh, and the filter come in different strength. You can get it from one stop to 20 stop. But the three most commonly used ND filter in landscape photography is a three stop, six stop, and 10 stop. Three stop lengthen exposure by eight times. Six stop lengthen exposure by about 60 times. Well, 10 stop ND filter lengthen exposure by 1000 times. So they have their application. For example, we use three and six stop to slightly lengthen exposure time for waterscape, but we use 10 stop ND filter to extend the exposure time, let's say one, two or three minutes to capture the moment of the cloud, okay. Again, the motion blur of the cloud here bring out the movement, but um, this create the motion and static contrast, something that's moving, there's moving, um, the moving cloud, something that's not moving, there's the, the cliff and the mountain here. So it's create the motion and static contrast. Um, and the at the same time, it makes the ripple of water smoothen, make it less distracting to the overall image. This is uh, a famous location on Faroe Island, the largest Mm, the largest lake on Faroe Island. So in the, in a certain angle, it looks like uh, it is hanging in the sky, okay. 
And long exposure other than insert the elements of dynamism in your image is also create a so-called guest host relationship. What does it mean? So in this image, the, uh, the mountain and the lodge here are the main subject of this image because they are landmark of this image. They are iconic uh, for this location. So they are the main subject. And in most of the time in landscape photography, the cloud and the sky and even the water, they are the supporting element. They are the secondary element or the guest of the image. So with the use of long exposure photography, the supporting element, the secondary element or the guest is now blurred out. So which make it less distracting to the human eye. This in turn make your host or the main element stand out from the cloud. So this is one of the application of the long exposure photography to make your image stand, uh, to make your main subject stand out, to create the so-called guest and host relationship, okay? And long exposure also lends itself to a clean, simple and minimalist styles of composition when you blur out all the moving element, okay? For example, this image was taken in Cape May in New Jersey with a 10 stop ND filter with 200 second exposure. We blur out the, the moving cloud, the water, the beach, and so on. Make it a very simple and minimalist styles of image. So um, I just want to say a few words about filters in landscape photography. In the digital era of photography, people have always say that the use of filter is unnecessary. The use of filter is, is outdated. But if you see the, the most commonly used filter in landscape photography, polarizer, graduate neutral dense filter, and neutral dense filter, two of them, the polarizer and the anti filter, their effect cannot be replicated in post processing or in the Photoshop. So I just want to emphasize their importance and and necessity in landscape photography. We use polarizer to control the re or reduce the reflection from non-metallic surface like the water, the ice, the rocks, the glass, the leaf. We use it to see through the windows or the water by excluding the refractive light. And we can use polarizer to restore the saturation, for example, the blue sky, green leaf, and even the rainbow. Uh, we can also use the polarizer to reduce the shutter speed by one to two stop, depends on the brand of the polarizer. So when you want to take a photo through the shop window or you have been to the observation deck, you want to take a photo uh, through, the, through the glass, but there are so many light shining into the glass and you couldn't get a good shot on the other side of the, of the window. So in most of the case, the polarizer can easily solve this issue by reducing the unwanted reflection on the window or on the glass, okay? And in landscape photography, we often use polarizer to reduce the reflection from the rocks, the water, and the sky and make it more saturation than, uh, make it more saturated. So this video just to show you how CPL is so powerful to cut off the unwanted reflection of water. Without polarizing effect and with polarizing effect, okay. So polarizer just help us to cut off most of the reflection on the surface of the water. So um, as you remember what I told you in the earlier slide, human eye has the better dynamic range than the camera. So when we see the scenery like in this image, the brighter sky and the darker ground, the human eye can see a good picture, but the camera cannot because the camera has lower dynamic range than human eye. So in this case, we often use the graduated neutral density filter to darken the sky, to restore the overexposed part of the sky, make the OR image well exposed. So in the other words, the GND filter used to um, push back the information of, of the overexposed sky back to the mid-tone and restore um, and make the OR image uh, over, uh, well exposed. So in the other words, GND filter used to compress the dynamic range of your camera by lowering the highlight area, okay? 
So there are different types of GND. The most common use GND is called a soft GND. So the soft GND has a long transition between the dark and transparent part of, uh, of the glasses. Okay, so we use it too um, when we have the not when we have no clear horizon line between the, the between the bright and dark area like the mountains, the building between the sky and the ground. While the hard GND with the very uh, definite horizon line between dark and transparent area, we use it to shoot, for example, the, the sea level, the skyline, and so on. And the other type, type the other types of GND is called the reverse GND. The darkest part is in the middle of the glasses. We use it to shoot the sunrise and sunset because during the sunrise and sunset, the middle part of the image is the, has the uh, strongest um, brightness. So we use the reverse GND to shoot sunrise and sunset. So when we try to select the, the right GND filter, or we try to buy the GND filter, before that, we have to understand what kinds of contrast we are dealing with in landscape photography. In general, the front lighting gives us the contrast between one to 2.5 stop, okay? I, uh, I mean, the contrast between the sky and the ground. While the side lighting gives us a contrast between two to four stop. While the back lighting, the sky is about three to five stop brighter than the ground, okay? If we shoot toward the sun directly, uh, in the cloudless there, it could give us the contrast up to seven or eight stop. So in general, we are dealing with the contrast between one to about eight stop, okay? So if you want to purchase a graduated intense view, I would strongly suggest just to start with three stop soft GND and five stop soft GND, okay? The reason is simple. Imagine if this is a three stop soft GND. It start with three stop here, and it is gradually come to two stop in the middle, and it's gradually come to one stop here, and the transparency part of zero stop. If we slide this filter in the holder up and down, if you push it all the way down, you can use it as a three stop GND. If you push it all, a little bit up, you can use it as a two stop GND. If you push it a little bit up, you can use it as a one stop GND. Similarly, if this is a five stop GND, you can use it as a five stop, four stop, three stop and to very good extent two and one stop. So by pushing it up and down in your holder, you can use it as a five, four and three stop GND. If you stack both together, it gives you the contrast up to eight stop, okay? So that's the reason why in landscape photography, we only need a three and a five stop soft GND to start with. And in the case of, um, Refraction in landscape photography, we often encounter the overexposed sky and the overexposed water. In this case, if you have two pieces of GND, you can use a five stop GND to darken the, the sky and three stop GND upside down to darken the brightness of the water. So, this is the way you use the GND in the case of the refraction. So the waterscape is one of the most well-known subjects in long exposure photography. The water changes appearance as you extend the exposure time. This is one over 10 second exposure. Um, so you can see a lot of short streak in the direction of the water flow. A lot of detail, it's kind of messy. Same for the one over six second exposure. A lot of detail, a lot of short streak over the water. But if you bump the exposure to half a second, to one second, and even two seconds, let's stop at one second. You can see that the short line just now is joining each other and becoming a longer line, longer streak. And the water becomes smoother and appear to be very dynamic due to this line detail in the water. So half a second exposure, one second, or two second exposure are probably the favorite timing for landscape photographer because the water appear to be very dynamic. If you further increase the shutter speed to five second, 10 second, you can see that the line start disappearing and the water becomes smoother and smoother. 15 second and 20 second, you can see all the line are completely gone, completely disappear and the water become very smooth and misty. 
So in the other words, uh, if you want to shoot the waterscape, you don't need ridiculously long exposure time. If you want to make your water looks, um, looks highly dynamic, you just need half a second to two second exposure. If you want to make your water look smooth, look simple, look dreamy, you just need 10 to 20 second exposure. So in most of the case, we, we try to uh, step down the aperture or lower the shutters, lower the ISO to lengthen exposure time. If none of these are working further, you have to rely on either three or six stop ND filter to lengthen exposure time. Okay, so if, if, as you can see from most of my image in this presentation, when I shoot a waterscape, I tend to maintain my shutter speed between half to two seconds to make the water highly dynamic make it look like it is flowing. Same for the seascape, seascape photography. We use a long exposure of half to two seconds to create a circular wave. For example, this, in this image, there's no foreground in this, uh, in this location. So we use half a second exposure. We use one second exposure when the wave is flowing back to the ocean. One second exposure, it makes your wave looks, um, looks like the streak as in this image. So the wave is now become your leading line and your foreground element. And here's another example, the shore next to a small village in Faroe Island. This is one over 40 second exposure. This location has a nice background, nice mountain range in the background, but the shore just looks ugly, just a bunch of dark and wet rocks here. But if you use half a second exposure, it turns your image from this uh, to this masterpiece here. So six stop and the filter, half a second exposure, allow you to create the streak like patterns. And now the wave of the water become your foreground elements and become your leading line, okay? Here, this image, when the wave is rushing toward the camera, I use half a second exposure to create the highly dynamic look, uh, looking leading line on the wave. Here's an example of the reflection. So this location, this village in, in Lofoten, it's windy all the time and the water is shallow you can rarely see the reflection in this location. But if you see a little bit of reflection, you know that this is a very precious moment in this location. So you have to think how you could improve your image. By using a long exposure of 240 seconds in this case, I blur out the movements of the cloud and I smooth the water and make the reflection much more um, prominent than than the previous image. So this is how you can improve your image using long exposure photography. So before I go to the next part of my presentation, just want to show you, share with you uh, the collection of my image from Greenland.
Okay, so so these are the image from the Greenland taken in the past two years. So I believe that some of you might question me why I'm so lucky because I got this Rick Silbert following me all the time. So the short answer is that I pay them to be our model. So the Rick Silbert here is, is this is called, this is named Peter the First. You can Google it online. It's a very famous Rick, uh, it's a very famous sailboat. It's the Russian expedition team. Um, so this is the first sailboat that circumnavigate the Arctic Circle. So this is the world record sailboat. And the rig sail here is used for photography purpose only. So we hire them to, uh, we ask them to come to, come to Greenland and act as our model and post it next to those uh, beautiful icebergs in Greenland, okay? Okay, so next thing I want to share with you is how to create the unique fields of vision. Everybody would agree that the grand landscape photography with wide-angle lens captured the beauty of the larger scene. If we talk about the American landscape photography historically, it has been a continuum of great photographers like Adam Anser to train their camera on the bigger scenic image like the majestic waterfall, the spectacular mountainscape, they are so grand and appealing, okay? Just like this image. It, so it makes perfect sense for every landscape photographer want to capture and communicate their magnificence. This is what thousands of photographers continue their, this sacral tradition, including myself and probably including some of, some of you. We all like to shoot the wide angle grand landscape. The wide angle lens is best used in the classic near file stuff of composition. Like in this image, you can include generous amount of foreground elements, background elements, and sky simultaneously create an image with considerable depth and composition power. So sometimes go wide, nonetheless greatly expand your creativity. While the world's intimate landscape is one of the big paradigm shift in the history of landscape photography, Elliot Porter, who shaped the formation of la intimate landscape, he didn't deal with the vista view of the landscape, nor the macro image, but an image with the subject in between them, okay? So he relied on different sets of elements for, uh, for smaller landscape. He emphasized on the detail, the texture, the patterns, the line, the color, the shape, and so on. So this is perhaps the ultimate purveyor of less is more philosophy in landscape photography. Although intimate landscape can be done by any lens, but telephoto lens play a huge role in intimate landscape work. So this is just an example of intimate landscape photography. This uh, is that image taken in Patagonia in Chile. Instead of the wide angle landscape with the foreground, mid ground, and background elements, I use the long lens to just to emphasize the texture and detail of this interesting looking mountain. Well, the mixture of texture, lines, and color here make up a very interesting um, intimate landscape photography. This is the highland in the Iceland. So my advice is that while you're exploring a world with ultra wide angle lens, do not hesitate to take out your telephoto lens. Look through it, look in your viewfinder or look in your live view and just search something that's unique and different from other, okay? Just scan through the landscape, find the elements like the color, the texture, the line, the shape, the detail, as I mentioned just now, okay? If you realize from some of the most prestigious landscape photography contests in recent year, most of the award-winning images are actually intimate landscape photography. The reason is simple because they offer something that are very different and very unique landscape that we are, we are not often seen by the naked eye. And again, this, again, disagree with the statement, seeing the unseen. So for the wider scenes, sometimes you have to stitch two or more image from, uh, from the wide angle lens. For, for example, this image, it was a stitch of three image that result in a 120 megapixel um, panorama image. You can see a lot of fine detail in it. Too. But I just want to show this for fun, just to show how crazy is the, is the weather when I shoot this image. Okay, 
So, okay, so the last thing I want to share with you is the composition. I'm not going to tell you about the rules of compositions, like rule of thirds, symmetric composition, and so on. But I'm going to share with you two tips on how to use a composition to improve your landscape photography. The first is the height of your of your shooting angle. Okay. So I believe that most of the people, most of uh, most and most of most of my students, they have they are used to one. Um, a, a very common behavior when they reach the parking lot, they walk out of the car, the next thing they do is just raise the tripod to the eye level and just start shooting, okay? Because the eye, uh, the tripod at the eye level is so comfortable to work with, I can understand that. But what you see at the eye level is what everybody see. <laughs> Excuse me. So there's no visual impact, nothing special when you shoot at the eye level. But when you stand in the higher ground, you can see what others couldn't see. You capture the landscape that is usually seen by the birds, okay? Uh, everything is under your feet. You can feel that you're dominating, you're in control of everything under your feet. So this is the visual impact of high angle shooting. This is why the, the drone photography is so popular in the past few years. You, um, if you want to achieve high angle shooting, you don't have to climb up the mountain. You don't have to use the drone. Sometimes a few steps walking uphill or just elevate your tripod a little bit will do the job perfectly. It will offer you a totally different view of perspective. Okay, Shooting lows with the use of wide angle lens help to exaggerate the perspective and giving the extra emphasis of the foreground elements. It makes a smaller foreground element like the eyes in this image looks big and it makes the, uh, the mountains in the background look small. So small thing looks big, big thing looks small. This is a way of the wide angle lens uh, could generate the visual tension that trap your UI into the image, okay? So I just want to say, a few words about how to do the focusing in this image when you are using the wide angle and when you are so close to the foreground element. Okay, so one way you can do it is the focus stacking. You set your tripod, you fix your tripod, and then you take two to three photo. One photo focus on your near object like the eyes here. Second photo focus somewhere in the mid ground. Third photo focus on in the, in the background and then in the Photoshop, you stack three of them together to achieve the sharp image from corner to corner. And the other way to, to do the focusing in this case is to use the so-called double distance focusing. If you're, for example, if this piece of ice is three feet away from your camera, all you have to do is three feet times two. You just have to focus six feet away, okay? And with the use of smaller aperture, you can, with the, and with the use of smaller aperture and double distance focusing, you're able to achieve the big, the maximum depth of field in your landscape image, okay? Another thing I want to share with you is a new concept about composition. When people see this image, they just call it the smiley face. The smiley face here is, is formed by two little rocks and a leaf frozen in a small pothole, okay? And the size of this pothole is just slightly bigger than my head. By getting very close to it with ultra wide angle lens, the perspective distortion make, that, make it look huge, okay? So now I, I want to tell you how this image was being crafted. The two process being involved are called the element selection and element placement. To tell a story in landscape photography is very different from other branches of photography. In trail photography, in documentary photography, as I mentioned earlier, the story can be told straight by capturing the moment, like unexpected event, interaction between people and so on. But in landscape photography, when the viewer look at the image, you want them to see the image as a complete story by connecting all the elements in the image together. All the elements in your image has its own role. They're not isolated and tidy. They have to be interact with each other. So the idea of composition in landscape photography is to create 
an image with a story. So what is element selection? To create an image, you are just given a frame with definite size, okay? So obviously you can put everything inside the frame. You have to select the element you want or the element that contribute to the story. So this is called the addition. Plus for this image, the smiley face, the rocks, the mountains, and the cloud, just four elements, that's it. You have to extrude the element that you don't want or not contributing to the story of this image. This is called the subtraction. Like the rock next to the smiley face, um, the dog poop next to the smiley face, the naked lady next to the rock. So those probably are interesting object, but they are not contributing to your story. So just leave them out of your frame. Okay, so this is somehow in consent with the concept, less is more. The most dangerous thing, the most dangerous thing of using wide angle lens is that people always try to put everything inside their image, make it a super massive image, okay? So subtraction is consent with the concept less is more. If they are not important for your image, just leave them outside of the frame. And in this image, I use the wide angle lens to enlarge the, um, the, the smiley face here. So this is called a multiplication. So the foreground elements like the smiley face here usually is not um, the, it's not iconic or it's not the landmark, it's not the main subject of the image. So the foreground element usually carry very little visual weight. So by enlarging it in the image, we add the visual weight to it. So we, it brings a balance to the other elements in the image. And with the use of wide angle lens, we shrink the elements to reduce the visual weight. In this case, we shrink the mountain in the far side. The mountain here is, the, is an easily recognizable landmark of this beach. When people see this mountain, they know that this is the Utaklef beach in Lofoten in Norway. So by making it smaller, it's reduced its visual weight. So that it's bring the balance back, uh, bring the balance with the other elements in your image. So by selecting and sizing the element in landscape photography is the art of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It is very similar to painting. And once you have this element ready, the smiley face, the rock, the mountain, the cloud, you have to think how you would like to place these elements or how you would like to decorate them in the frame. Okay, this is what I call the element placement. By posing your camera in the three-dimensional space, up and down, left and right, front and back, it will change the position of these elements and their relative position in the image in a completely different way. The way I place this element is as follows. The smiley face in the lower center, very close to the border of the frame to create some visual tension. And then, the rocks in the middle left, the mountain on the middle right, but the moving cloud will create that using the long exposure, which aim to create a vector that pull the viewer eye toward the upper right direction. So these elements placed in a continuous and zigzag path along the viewer side. When the viewer look at this image, they must first draw the attention by the smiley face because it looks funny, it looks interesting. And then the, the viewer side will go further to the rocks here and surrounding and the viewer will notice that, oh, this is the beach. There's a rock, there's an, the, o, the ocean here. And then the viewer side will go further to the mountain and recognize it as the landmark of Utaklef Beach in Lofoten in, uh, in Norway. And finally, the viewer side will be drawn toward the upper right corner by the moving cloud. So this process leads your viewer to read the story of your image using the elements and the vector. This is called a visual continuity, a way of landscape photographer tell the story, okay? At the same time, these three elements create an implied triangle that is able to trap your viewer eye in the image, okay? And 
Finally, I would like to emphasize that the importance of the post-processing, okay, with your, your unique composition style and with your unique post-processing workflow, it's allow you to create an image that belong to your own, okay, with your own personality and with your own unique style. So just, this is just the answer to my first question of my presentation. With the technical skill, with the understanding of the lights and moment and the environment, with your unique composition and post-processing style, allow you to create a so-called the good image. So just ask yourself, what is a good image? Ask yourself, is your image unique? Mm, does your image easily rec replicable by other people? Can your image evoke the viewer resonance? Does your image carry emotion? Does your image tell a story? Does your image has documentation or historical value? Can your image evoke the imagination of the viewer? Does your image has your own personality and your own, um, your own, uh, your own style? Okay, so all this elements here make up a so-called the good image. Okay, so before I end my, my presentation, just want to share with you the last slideshow, the collection of my images of, of uh, Northern Light in Norway and in Sweden. Okay, so before I end my, my presentation, just want to express my appreciation to my sponsor and the partner who support my career over the past few years. And if you want to look at my image, you can go to my website, carvelin.com. The best way is to follow me on my Facebook page. I usually update my Facebook page with new image um, twice per day and you're also welcome to email me anytime you have any question and you're also welcome to follow my YouTube channels I used to update the, the weekly photo tips on my YouTube channel so welcome to subscribe to my YouTube channel and I have a few ebooks on my website so feel free to check them out some of them are free like the Antarctica trip and how to photography in the ice and I have an ebook very complete explanation about the filters and long exposure photography and also i have the ebook about my post-processing workflow and finally if you want to spend money you are welcome to my my camera store and just check it out the, the product there you can take 10 percent off with this discount code here for the photo pro tripod and for the nissi filter and if you want to support me support my career uh, as a landscape photographer um, you can join my VIP membership, just $5 per month on the Patreon. So I will offer monthly photo seminar, critics, forum, and so on. Okay, so I will end my presentation here. 